Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast. And I am delighted to introduce to you today someone that you may not have heard of, but I think that you will hear a lot of in the future, and that's Dr. Joshua Hillman. He's a Harvard trained, board certified physician licensed in 14 states. He embraces an integrative approach to health, wellness, medicine, and life. He has two degrees in biochemistry, which includes an undergraduate from Harvard and a master's from the University of Cambridge in the UK. His medical degree is from Harvard Medical School and MIT. He is passionate about applying his biochemical knowledge to real world challenges. He is board certified in emergency medicine and lifestyle medicine and has served as an attending physician throughout his career and ultimately as the medical director for Hippocrates Health Institute in Palm Beach, Florida, and now and also has worked in a similar position at True North Health Clinic um, in California. So he is now working for working on his own more and he will be actually leading a summit uh, this year on the topic of reversing dementia. So be looking forward to hearing more about that. Dr. Hellman, is there anything else that you would like to say about yourself in your introduction? Well, Ronnie, thanks. That's a great introduction. I would just say if you, after watching this podcast, if you want to learn more, come to my website, which is drjosh.com, drjosh.com. Drjosh.com. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, one of the reasons, Dr. Hellman, that I mean, you, we kind of got connected randomly. And I think that uh, one of the things that's very interesting is longevity has been a topic of interest for our group this year. It's actually going to be a part of the UK Fruit Fest of the, the event. Uh, this year is going to be kind of the, the main theme of the event is longevity. And that's um, something that you, you, you specifically look at. But I think that what this audience may appreciate as well as your position, having worked with True North, having worked with um, uh, Hippocrates, which are both well known really in the raw foods and, and the plant-based community as uh, centres where, where people go, uh, you know, very professional places people go for fasting and, and for having a, a, a raw food uh, journey or, or escape or retreat, whatever you want to call it. Sure. And that's so. So that's that's fascinating, but. Let's talk about you a little bit at first, and I'm, I'm interested. I, I don't know a lot about your background and how your lifestyle and diet has been and all that kind of stuff. And uh, how how were you brought up? Was it a standard kind of a diet or something different? What was your lifestyle like growing up? Yeah, it's funny. Growing up, I think my diet was a little bit better than the average American because my father is a physician, a gastroenterologist. So he was very aware. So I remember as a, as a boy, maybe six, seven, eight years old, I was really upset because all my neighbors, uh, all the kids in the neighborhood were allowed to drink carbonated, you know, sugar beverages, sodas. And my parents wouldn't carry that stuff in the house. I'm like, you know, mom and dad, like, why? You know, uh, you know, Billy's got it next door. So, so it was interesting that, that I, it's, but in retrospect, my parents were totally looking out for me. You know, including more fruits and vegetables and less processed foods and less fast food. But at the time, as as a kid who watches TV and sees the neighbors and who who frankly gets addicted to the salt, oil, and sugar that's in all these processed foods, I actually felt deprived. Now I look back and it's like, thank you so much, mom and dad. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so it so, sounds like it was a healthier diet than what a lot of people were eating. Yeah, I, I would say so. And, and, you know, my my dad would also take me on rounds to see, you know, gastroenterology, GI patients, you know, and, and he would, you know, he would say, you know, do you see like that patient over there? He has gastric ulcers because he eats lots of salami and, and drinks lots of beer, you know, so I was like, oh, so I, at a very early age, I was, I was connecting the dots. I don't think the average person gets that experience when they're seven years old. Absolutely. I think that one of the main things that happens for people that go on a bit of a dietary journey is that they make that connection or at some point they make that connection between their diet and their health outcomes. And surprisingly enough, it seems that for the average person, those things are kind of disconnected in their head. True. Yeah. yeah. 
So did you have any particular health issues growing up at all? Actually, I did. And I, um, I, I was a pretty chubby as a little boy and also had some some reflux issues. And, right. and I, remember, I remember this wasn't just random patients that my dad talked about. It, it turned out to be me. And I remember, I remember my dad put me, I got scoped um, um, and, uh, and, and had a barium enema and, it had, and I actually had a workup at that time. And, you know, my parents were like, you know, you, you need to cut out on the candy and the, and the junk and eat more real food. So, so yeah. Yeah, so um, at, at what point you'd already made that connection diet-wise, did you at any point in your childhood or other life, did you start taking that to the next level uh, and, and start making changes yourself or was that later on in life? That, that was actually later on in life, I, I would say. But, but I, think, I think you're right. I think the seeds were planted back then. What about your your career and your decision to go down this medical route where did that come from obviously background or was that your own choice and, and how did you end up going the path you did with um you know the, the places you chose to study and things like that yeah so i mean I, I started off i would say a pretty typical career after medical school i got, got some surgical training ended up in emergency medicine and you know, and practice there. But, but what I found amazing is that I, I was having my own health issues maybe 15 years ago with being overweight and then also getting high blood pressure. And here I am, you know, Harvard trained physician. I should know how to fix this. And I, I couldn't do it with the traditional medications. And, and, and I was, I was pretty frustrated, and, but, but also humbled and said like, look, I'm not dumb, you know, like, why, why can't, why am I having trouble controlling my own blood pressure? You know, like, what, this, this is like basic stuff that you learn as part of your medical training. And, and it was at that point, I, I kind of opened my eyes. I, uh, I had heard in, in, in Harvard Medical School, not as part of the core curriculum, but uh, as, a, as an added bonus, you know, if you want to after school, hear a lecture from Dr. Neil Barnard. And um, so I, I remember what he said, but I also remember, uh, you know, about the importance of plants. But I also remember thinking, you know, this is all really interesting information, and, and, and it may well be true, because I remember back to the Framingham study, you know, following people, you know, the, the, the vegans were the group of, of um, who, who got less heart disease and had higher life expectancy. So I knew deep down that the importance of eating plants but I also thought if, if I, you know, I, I'm working in this very top-down environment at Harvard and ultimately other institutions, I don't think my attendings are, are going to, you know, think really highly of this. You know, th this was not the core curriculum. This was an afterthought, you know, almost. Um, so I, I kind of suppressed that until I had my own personal struggles, you know, years later. And it was at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, it was like, I, I'm open to this information, you know, I'm, I'm open to any solution, let me start looking, because that's the way I am, I'm, I'm a sponge, I'm always, you know, trying to get information from here and there and everywhere else, and, and I think that's how I ended up finding this alternative or integrative approach. Can you talk about medical training a little bit, you talk about, you trained, you trained at Harvard, you trained at Cambridge in the UK, how much of it goes into talking about dietary causes of disease or the connection between diet and disease or being able to use diet to treat disease. Is, is that a big part of the syllabus of medical training as far as you're aware? No, unfortunately, traditional medicine, you know, maybe we get one day on nutrition. And so, so. One in, in, day a year, one day. No, like one day. Like for the whole training, and, oh, wow. and, and, and even then, it was about you know the which vitamins are important and how to write down um, you know if 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 you have a, a surgical patient who can't eat and you have to give intravenous nutrition, you know what what were the safe ways to do this? So 
So that in traditional medical training, that's what I got. Now I did learn a good, a, a lot more about nutrition in, through my two biochemical degrees. But, but the truth is most physicians don't have two degrees in biochemistry. Right, right. So what was fascinating there is you talked about there was a lecture from Neil Barnard that was like an additional add-on thing that you could go to and be like, how did that work? He, he was just uh, voluntarily giving a lecture to the students or what? Because I remember actually I was in the U.S. a couple of years ago and I happened to be in Florida and I found out that Dr. Clapper, Dr. Michael Clapper was giving a, a a presentation to the students, to the medical students, and, and we were able to go along and watch it, and it was full of students. Um, so I guess, I don't know if there's a similar thing like that, that there's maybe programs where they just have, uh, where they have the doctor go in giving a presentation. Was it, was it a similar thing of that kind of nature? Yeah, I think it was very similar, but, you know, we're talking 34 years ago. Wow, wow. And, and, and so... Whereas today, there's a lot more information about this. I think, I think every year it becomes easier and easier to promote this type of information and, and to find this type of information. But I think it was very similar. And, and, uh, but unfortunately today, even today at most medical schools, you know, this is not part of the core curriculum yet. And that's, I love what Dr. Clapper has been doing is to try to, and, and still Dr. Barnard, trying to get the, uh, this information about the importance of plants in the core medical training curriculum, because once it's part of the core curriculum, people, they'll teach it to the students because they have, it'll be tested on the test. I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to your own personal struggles. So you ended up with high blood pressure and were you saying that you were trying to treat that with medication at first? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. How is typically that that uh, treated with medication? How does that work? Yeah. So so there are different uh, blood pressure pills you can you can try. There are things like metoprolol. There there are you know I, I ended up trying two, three, four at the same time. And <laughs> yeah, I mean because they're, they're different classes. You know, there's some that will you know decrease your heart rate, and there's some that will relax your blood vessels and and, and these are all important, you know, modalities in the right setting, but, but it was, it was frustrating. It was definitely frustrating. And, and frankly, um, I think dangerous because when it comes to blood pressure, you certainly don't want it too high, but you also don't want it too low. Okay. Were you encouraged to exercise? I believe that I've heard that helps with blood pressure. Yeah. And so the answer is yes. And but like other things, I, um, I I find exercise easier to do it in groups. And sure. I guess, you know, 15 years ago, you know, I, I did work out not as much as I do now, but, you know, it, it was maybe once or twice a week. It wasn't, the, you know, like for me now, it's like it's almost like a daily thing that I want to do. Nice, nice. So, how, and, and just for a bit of more information, the, those blood pressure medications, a lot of people are on those, I believe. And I've even known people that have been trying to go plant-based and they, they, they maybe can't quite get it right and they're still on their medications and stuff like that. Um, my impression is that uh, medication tends to have a negative side effect as well or can have. And you mentioned there that the blood pressure can get too low. but how do these these blood pressure? I think you said that they they thin they thin the blood or they take the heart rate down. Is that is that right? And well, is it a negative side effect to that? Yeah. So so they can some of them will, will decrease the heart rate. Some of them will relax blood vessels. But many of these uh, uh, blood pressure pills do have side effects, such as you can feel tired with them. You know, they can make you sleepy they can affect um intimacy i mean it affect all these, sure, different, sure, sure. All, all these <laughs> different things <laughs> so what i'm kind of i'm kind of fascinated by this idea that of how a seed gets planted right so you had that kind of seed planted in your childhood of the connection with diet and and disease you also had the lecture from neil barnard but 
it took a while until some of these personal problems reared up a bit more and 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 for for you to maybe make some more changes and what, what did you do at that point how did you take the journey a little bit further yes yeah, so i just ended up meeting with a lot of um a lot of different physicians and because I, I was like, I don't want to treat myself. I, let, let me. There, there's got to be some smart doctors out there. But but it was it was interesting that what what ended up you know the thing that that finally cinched it for me was um, reading the China study and also going to a lecture in Las Vegas of all all places with the CEO of Whole Foods at the mm-hmm. time who basically to a room of like 40 of us basically said, if you want to improve your health, um, like when you, when you go to shop at my, my, my store, Whole Foods, only focus on 10% of the things there, only buy the, the fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And I was like, what CEO in, in the world would ever tell you don't buy 90% of the products in my store? <laughs> so that, that, that really, that really caught my attention. And I was like, and then, you know, and then it brought back these other thoughts. I'm like, I think he's right. I've, I've got to, I've got to pay attention to this and like a sponge read as, as much as I can and, and try to, uh, try to, try to make some changes. Let me ask you about the China study. Could you talk a little bit about that and how did you come across that and what was your impression of it? Yeah. So, so I, I, for, as a biochemist, I love the China study because it, you know, it looked at different parts of, of China over long periods of time and specifically saw that the those Chinese who were eating plants had much lower rates of, of cancer and other diseases compared to the meat eaters. So you know, here was yet more information. And then and then you know, delving down deep, like what is it about what is it about animal protein? That is causing cancer in these in these problems, and 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 it's it's that same exploration that ties into longevity because it turns out we know now that if you're eating animal protein, it it basically hurts the mTOR system, which is one of these basic genetic uh, pathways that are conserved from yeast to plants to dogs and cats and to us. And this mTOR system, it basically knows how much animal protein you're eating. And if you're eating more, it, it speeds up your biologic clock. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> well, there's so many things I want to ask, but can we talk about that a little bit more, the mTOR system and that kind of process? And could you go a bit deeper into that? And how, what, what does that all mean? How does it work? And, uh, and, and why? And uh, I guess another question. Does it have an effect? Is it all animals that are affected in the same way, or is it an indication that humans are not as well adapted for eating meat? Or what's the implications of that information? Yeah, so so this mTOR system is is conserved, and you know the interesting thing it, it, it's not just it's not just animal protein, but it's also calories in general. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about humans or dogs or cats or earthworms, or even yeast, one way to prolong their life and to, degrease, and to decrease their disease rate is to calorie restrict, uh-huh. not give too many calories to people. And the mTOR system is just, it's, it's a way for the body on a cellular level to basically have a indicator stick saying, you know, are you getting high energy or low energy from your food? So, um, so, you know, what, and if you think about it, um, there, there's this concept of hormesis. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But we're not as humans, and, and most animals are, I mean, actually, I can't think of any animal that's designed to sit here and not have any activity, you know, sitting from the telly and just, um, you know, not exercise. You know, that, no, we, we are designed, animals, all animals, I think, are designed to move and to uh, be active and not to just to sit. Right, right. Um, so 
it actually affects all. So what you're breaking down, you said that it actually kind of affects all animals. And it's to do with the level of energy it's bringing in and stuff like that. Okay. Sure, sure. sure. And, and actually, it's not it's not just the mTOR system. There are also proteins called sirtuins that affect how the DNA is wrapped, so that how how epigenetics, how methyl groups and other groups can affect DNA. Uh, DNA expression. And then the third is, I know this is getting very nerdy for people. So in addition to the sirtuin and the mTOR, you've got the AMPK system, which measures how much glucose or sugar the cells are exposed to. So you've got these three different systems. And, and to me, this, this is like science fiction. It didn't have to work out this way, but it, but it, it has worked out that these same systems from yeast are conserved in plants, animals, including humans because they're so important. And if you can slow down the energy, the amount of energy consumption using these, sy these systems, you can hack and prolong longevity by turning back the biologic clock. So I, I find that so exciting. But am I right in thinking that, that what, what you're not, um, but what you're not saying is, as far as I'm trying to pick up is, you're not saying, the reason the cutting animal products out is good is because less calories. It's not just that, it's it's a part of what the animal proteins do. Because if if you have the same number of calories but it's from plants, are you still saying that if the longevity is not as not as affected as badly? Right. I, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is if if you're getting your protein sources from plants, it's not having the same bad effect on the mTOR system that the animal protein is. And and to get super nerdy, that the reason is that there's more branch chain amino acids that affect this mTOR system in the animal proteins compared to the plant proteins. So there, there is a biochemical reason, um, definitely. That's that's amazing. I would like to talk a little bit about studies in general, you know, because I think that a lot of us people are interested in a plant based or raw or a vegan diet. Uh, you know, there's a lot of moral arguments or something about the, the vegan diet, but there's many people that still aren't convinced that it's healthier to be plant-based. And some, some people would say that, that it's healthier to eat meat even and stuff like that. So I was thinking of, what do you think? I, I was trying to run through some of the studies that, that maybe some of the strongest studies that kind of seem to show evidence in that direction of the plant-based diet. And um, looking back over... The history of this, of di I, I guess it's not a very long period of time. Science has really been looking deeply into diet and its effect on health. And I guess particularly because in the past, the, the issue was really people didn't eat enough. That was the, people didn't have enough food. So that was the main food problem for humans for thousands or maybe millions of years. All of a sudden, we're living in abundance. And now we've got a total other problem. And... I think back to, for example, there's the seven countries study with Ansel Keys. You mentioned the Framingham study, um, the China study. I, I'm thinking about, you know, Caldwell Esselstein or Dean Ornish with heart disease. And I've heard of things like the Harvard Nurses study. Like I don't know exactly all the details of these, but it, it, for, for you, do you want to go over for yourself? What do you think are some of the most compelling um pieces of information and, and studies and evidence for you of the benefits of a plant-based diet? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, for me though, I, I, I guess I'm a biochemistry nerd. I mean, for, for me, the fact that not just in humans, but in, in all animals, that we can basically, um, it looks like you're frozen right now, but, yeah, it's 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 frozen temporarily. I'll just pause okay. it. Oh, we've come back. We've come back. Okay. So, so what what I find amazing is is not not even the human studies, but just animals in general. We know th this is pretty established that you take any animal, human or otherwise, and you restrict how many calories they have, you prolong their life. But but when I heard this this the, these results 10, 20 years ago, I'm like. Well, that's interesting, but you know what? I enjoy eating. Yeah. So, so how how am I going to restrict calories? And at the time, I didn't realize that fasting, sure, it, it takes work, but it's it's doable. And and I guess at the time, 
you know, I, I didn't really understand that if you eat plants, they're much, most of them are much less calorie dense. So you can eat a lot more, you can eat a lot more plants and but you're not consuming that many calories. So I didn't connect the dots at the time, but, but to me that that's one of the most compelling things is, um, is that you want to limit your caloric intake. And when you, when you do eat calories, you want to make sure it's, or it's dense with the, the micronutrients and the phytochemicals that can actually help the antioxidants that can help your health. Okay, brilliant. Let's um, talk about yourself. So, how did uh, how did you go about changing your diet? What benefits did you notice? And you know, ultimate ultimately, I guess, where is your diet now? What are you happy with? And if you want to talk anything about that, yeah. So, so in my own journey, I it took me years. So, you know, I, I did this research. I understood that, you know. The, the vegans lived longer, had less high blood pressure, had these, that, that, you know, fewer bad effects. But I, my attitude a dozen years ago was great. That's, that's great information, but I'm not met, ready to make the whole leap. What, what's, what's the, the minimal thing I can do? <laughs> what's the minimal thing I can do and have a great result? So like the first year I cut out meat and, you know, I felt better. I lost some weight, but, you know, I was like, you know what? I can do better. And so then, then I cut out, you know, fish and, and, um, the following year, I, I finally cut out milk and dairy and cheese and, and cutting out cheese was the hardest thing for me. I was super addicted to that. But, but I, when I've been describing this to, to patients and to other people, I say, I say, you know, be kind to yourself. I mean, there's some people who can, who can hear this information and they can make the change overnight. But what I know now is most of us, are, are truly in Western society are addicted to food and to the salt, oil, and sugar. And, 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 and when you, when you make a shift, when you eliminate meat or, or huge amounts of fat from your diet, I mean, I remember I, I got headaches. I literally got headaches for two weeks just from cutting out meat because I was, a, I was addicted to the fat. So these, if I think people need to understand that this is a true, this is a true addiction even though it's not talked about, this is a true addiction. And, you know, our brains are designed to crave salt, oil, and sugar, even though, which, which makes sense if you're, you know, a hunter-gatherer trying to survive, like you, you, you want the calorically dense food, but we're in a very different world now. You know, most, many of us have food available 24-7. That, that's not how our ancestors evolved. You mentioned something there about the, the impact of giving up meat and you had a headache and stuff and that kind of brings up for me something that's talked about a lot in the raw foods world which is detox and a lot of people talk about they they stop their diet they change their diet and they give, they go through a detox and many people will talk about this as a very difficult process and some people it's going on for years and they're continuing to detox over and over and it's like a lifestyle of detox and some people think I, I, I'm going to detox too fast and I'm going to harm myself. So I better slow it down and all of these ideas. Do you, I'd like to ask you about detox and what do you think that means and uh, what's the realities around that? And, and why would you have a headache, for example, when you give up certain foods and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I'll address, um, I, I think we could actually talk for an hour just about toxins and detoxification because toxins actually speed up aging. But, but to, to, to answer your question, I think what, what happened in my case, because I, and, I, and I'm sure my toxin level was high because I, I live in a Western country. If you're eating, if you're eating meat, it's at the top of the food chain it has much higher levels of of heavy metals, PCBs, uh, forever chemicals, and things like that. So I, I think that's real. And, and I think, you know, some of it, I was actually uh, mobilizing toxins uh, in the process of cutting out meat. But I think the other thing is, I think I was, the headache was, was from an addiction from one of the core centers of my brain that, that, that uh, it craves high caloric food. And I suddenly took away this food and my dopamine levels in those centers went down. Um, but but I, I think it's important for people to understand 
that toxins are a real thing and that we in our modern society face lots of these man-made petrochemical toxins that our ancestors never saw. Or another one, big one that I'm seeing are mold toxins. Did our ancestors have exposure to mold? Of course they did, but they didn't live in airtight buildings that are fuel efficient, but a great culture media for growing mold. So I, I think the detoxification uh, issue is real. And, um, and, and I also caution someone with multiple chronic diseases, you know, try, don't try to do this all this by yourself because I've, I've definitely seen patients when they make dietary and other changes too quickly, um, they release a bunch of toxins all at once because their immune system is getting revved up and they're busting biofilm and biofilm is this biologic film that bacteria in the blood and other parts of the body can make that will store parasites and heavy metals and these other toxins. So when you start busting the biofilm, it breaks all at once and releases all these toxins all at once. And I know this is a little bit confusing, but I think it's important to at least sure. touch on. Sure. I'd love to hear a little bit about your typical lifestyle at the moment in terms of what, what and, and all around, like diet and maybe anything else you do for your health on a daily basis, like routines and things like that. What, what, what's your typical day at the moment? Yeah, so my typical day is is I wake up uh, early. You know, I'm you know this interview is at six in the morning. I I normally will actually get up at five in the morning and, and work out uh, strenuously at, at least four or five times a week and. I'm addicted to the exercise, which which is all good. Uh, in, in in terms of meals, I try. I don't. I'm not perfect, but I try to push off my first meal to around noon time, and I try to have my last meal around uh, six or seven p.m. And in terms of what I'm eating, I'm I try to focus just on fruits and vegetables. I'm I'm certainly not a hundred percent raw like I was uh, when I was at Hippocrates, but I. I'm definitely a fan of of raw food and 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 a fan of getting away from anything processed. Sure, sure. Yeah. Are you um, totally a vegan diet, or what would you would you look at that? Yeah, I say yeah. I, I won't intentionally eat something that is not from plants. Sure. And, and and I got to this journey from from a health perspective, but I I understand and resonate now with the ethical side too. But just from a health perspective, the higher up you go on the food chain, you have much higher levels of these toxins because these toxins get magnified where, you know, plants, you know, there might be a little bit in the water, a little bit more in plants. But if, if you're if you're eating animals that eat those plants, you get much higher levels of these PCBs, DDT and, and other other toxins. So from a health standpoint, I don't want to eat stuff on the top of the food chain. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, something that I'm coming across, I think, I wanted to ask is, I had a perception that one, the, the reason that animal foods would affect us badly, and there's maybe different reasons for that, but I had this impression that we are less of a carnivorous animal or less of an omnivore than, than is generally suggested, and that that's why these foods would do us harm or some damage uh, over time. Um, but you're kind of suggesting that actually it would affect all animals in a bad way to have um, a high level of animal protein, it seems. And so would it be the case that like dogs would be better off eating less meat and, and things like that? I'm, I'm curious about that. And what's your stance on human, the human body? Is, is, it a, is it an omnivore? Is it a plant-based? What do you see the human body as? set up for, I suppose. Yeah, so, so there's a lot to unpack there. So the first thing I want to be clear about is there are definitely some animals in the in the natural kingdom that are obligate, you know, or that need to eat carnivores, like cats are an example. Uh, um, but, but what I am saying is for all animals in general, if they eat too, if, if they eat too much, you know, or if we as humans feed them processed food, high calorically dense food, their life expectancy is going to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that 
That's one of the things I'm saying. Now, if you look at our ancestors, obviously, I think our ancestors were omnivores, as in their one of the biggest challenges for our ancestors was survival when there wasn't enough calories. And and realistically, I mean, it's not a pretty picture, but I'm sure cannibalism, some of our ancestors have survived on cannibalism, and I'm not recommending that for any of us. Um, but, but in terms of um, ideally, I think we're ideally meant to be, to eat plants. But, you know, uh, if you look at our, our adaptations and, and our teeth and things like, like that, but, um, but I think it's, it's wrong to say that, you know, our ancestors, you know, never eat meat. No, that, 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 you know, we're designed to be omnivores, um, okay. to, basically to survive. Um, but th that's, that's in the past. We're in a different world now where, you know, we, we have the ability to get calories much more so than our ancestors. And I think the ideal fuel is going to be plants because of the much higher levels of the phytonutrients from the plants. It would, it would appear to me still that it's in terms of a, a human, the human body, um, our ability to attain animal foods is very limited in terms of if we, if we don't have weapons, if we don't use traps and things like that, actually trying to chase an animal down and, and kill it is pretty difficult for us and also not necessarily something that we have a great, that it seems to me that we have a great instinct to do. What do you, what do you think about that kind of idea? I, I agree with, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, if, if you show, you know, a three-year-old, you know, the picture of an animal, their reaction is going to be to love it, not to try to kill it and eat it. I, I agree with that. But but you can't deny that we have, we had ancestors who were hunter-gatherers that would hunt, sure. you know, to survive. I mean, and, and the fact that we're adaptable, um, I think has led to human survival. But again, that that's ancient history, and I mean, I find those arguments interesting, but but the reality is, you know, we we live in a world today, and um, we we should focus on health and and also ethics. I mean, I the idea of of killing other sentient beings when you don't need to do that, I I just think is wrong. So let's get into your work with Hippocrates and. True North, and how, when, when did that start? Where, where did you start taking your career in that direction? Yeah, it was, it was about six years ago. I was uh, the medical director at Hippocrates, and, um, you know, I found Hippocrates amazing in that we would take patients with chronic diseases and tell them to, you know, cut out all the processed foods and just eat raw vegan food, and they would lose weight. And they would a lot of their chronic diseases would go away. So so it was amazing. And, and and the average patient was there between one and three weeks. But you know we would see changes just after a week even. So that that was remarkable. But I have to say I don't agree with everything at a, that that happened at Apocrys, including you know fruit was relegated. They would only serve fruit you know two mornings out of the week, and then. No other fruit was allowed because the, the claim was that fruit somehow caused cancer. And I, I mean, I can understand the, 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 the thinking maybe 50 years ago about sugar, um, but, but the reality is that cancer cells can also grow later, later on on fat. So, um, I, so it, it was fascinating that they only serve fruit two days out of the week for one meal. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I feel like this is almost an exclusive. We have the former medical director of Hippocrates <laughs> Health Institute is saying that he doesn't agree with their anti-fruit policy. Is that what you're saying? That, that is what I'm saying, yes, sir. So it's, it's fascinating because the, Hippocrates is well known in the in the raw foods world, I would say, and and Dr. Brian Clement and the people involved. It goes back to Anne Wigmore before that, Victoria Skolvinskis, and um, some people will know that whole story. And it's it's an amazing place. Like I've been there not as a patient. I I went there to have lunch basically and look around, and it's an amazing facility. Like, like that is a, an amazing place and a beautiful place and 
when I was there, I think the, the weather, the temperature was perfect. There was the meditation pond. There was it just going under the trees felt like perfect temperature and beautiful environment and, and beautiful place. Um, so I, I, I encourage people to check it out. But I was when I went to the salad bar, uh, it was no fruit, and I was kind of slightly expecting that, which is fine. But I did find that there was no no tomatoes, but there was peppers, or there were certain fruit. There were certain things that were there. I remember saying, "Why no tomatoes?" And they went, "Oh, well, it's," uh, and they couldn't really explain why. You know, whoever it was on the on the board, right. there was a lot of sprouts. Um, but they had a whole bunch of like sauces that I thought, well, these are like kind of processed looking or whatever. But it has been always been quite well known to a lot of people this this approach that Hippocrates has and Brian Clement's um, position that fruit that they have to cut out fruit for the people because of the because of you know cancer or certain things that that is that is um well that's what that's what they that's what they believe i suppose and um it'd be interesting to talk about that and could you talk a little bit more about what is their belief around that what is the idea because i believe they say they have research on it and stuff and could you go a little bit more into why you don't agree with that yeah, so so let me start by saying that there there is a little piece I do agree, which is that uh, you know Brian claims, and I think it's true that if you look at the fruits today compared to 100 years ago, they they've been hybridized to be bigger, you know, more um, you know, you know, sweeter. Um, so so I agree that the fruit that we have available today is is different than our ancestors had in many cases. But the, the specific piece about cancer being caused by eating too much fruit, I just don't buy because um, as you mentioned, you know, at the bar, there, there's all these sauces and there's, there's oil, you know, they're, they're <laughs> not opposed to oil, which is calorie dense. And, you know, we, we definitely saw some patients there with stage three and stage four cancer. And, what, what, patients with stage four cancer, many of those cancers no longer live on glucose. They want to live on fat. So if, if you're going to use the cancer argument, then you should also be cutting out the fat. And, and they certainly don't cut out the fat because, you know, there, there's a certain day every week where it's avocado day and people would load up on three or four avocados for their lunch, which, which I feel like I'm, I'm not recommending that you do that unless you're trying to gain weight. But, um, uh, <laughs> and then the other thing is they are, um, I think they were promoting too much salt in the form of seaweed. And, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not opposed to people occasionally eating seaweed, but they, some people would take it all the time. And what's, what's not generally known is most of the seaweeds are very high in iodine. I think many people on that diet um, are getting too much iodine and they end up with thyroid problems. And I, and I saw that when they would come back and return, many of them had Hashimoto's and other thyroid diseases. And I believe it's because they were getting too much iodine because they were taking too much seaweed because the average seaweed has like a thousand percent of the USRDA, which isn't a big deal if you take, have it occasionally. But if you're eating that every single day, you could easily overdose on iodine. So let, let me just let me just repeat that statistic. The average like seaweed has a thousand times the RDA of iodine. Is that what you're saying? Uh, oh, it's it's um I, I would say it's, it's ten times. It, it's it's if if the normal RDA is a hundred, it has a thousand. So ten times okay. what, we're, what we're supposed to have. Ten and, times. Right. And 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 the point I'm trying to make is sure you know eat seaweed occasionally, but it seemed like there people were eating it every single day. And I was also seeing thyroid disorders on people on this diet chronically. And so I, I think there, there may well be a connection. I just wanted to make a small point uh, answering back the claim of the um, fruit being evolved, uh, evolved to be bigger and sweeter. 
And the the answer back to that would be that is, or well, the way I would see it is that's absolutely true of um, temperate climate and fruits that are generally outside of the tropical zone. So things like cherries and apples and all these things have been selectively bred to be bigger and sweeter than what they would would be in 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 the natural environment. But in terms of in the tropics, the tropical fruits would in generally are, are even fruits that you can find in the jungle can be big and can be sweet. And so I think we're trying to replicate the, the tropical fruit with the, the northern climate fruits. And um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I, I do think that there is still, uh, otherwise the, the big primates wouldn't, have, wouldn't get the calories from them to live on. So I think there is, that's, that's the answer back to that. That's a one, one um, comment on that or one thought at least. But I would, I would like to ask some specific things because my concern about some places, I think Hippocrates and it's, it's maybe not, maybe not focused on this, but I think there are some places that, especially outside of the US, I'm thinking that are kind of promoting this, uh, that they can heal cancer or, or, or that they're a cancer clinic or they can, and maybe not heal cancer, but they, the way they put their message across definitely implies that and they might not say that specifically and i believe that, that hippocrates has mentioned having success stories with with cancer what i've found in my years in a raw food diet and going to a lot of events and meeting a lot of people is the stories of cancer reversal and cancer success to me are, are quite limited and, and compared to the people that have lost weight, got rid of their blood pressure, got rid of their diabetes, got rid of autoimmune conditions, digestive problems, like that's quite common to see with people changing their diet to a raw vegan diet. But cancer, I've not seen like the same levels of amazing success. And I've actually seen people decide not to do conventional treatment, try going plant-based or raw or vegan or one of these approaches, and it's not worked for them, unfortunately. And, and, and and the their, their situation got worse. And I'm interested in, in terms of with cancer, what is, is there a, was there a predictable level of success with people that were coming in um, having a, having a, a, a reversal or a good experience or extending their life or whatever, whatever that, that success might look like? Um, is that something you would know about, or as the medical director there? And what, what's your thoughts on on that? Yeah, so my thoughts not just from Hippocrates, but also at True North. I mean, we there, there are published papers out of True North showing how fasting can reverse certain types of the slow growing cancer. But but what I would say is is that people, if if they're unfortunately dealing with cancer. It's not an either or. I would look at both. I would look at what the traditional recommendations are, but I would also look at the alternatives. And there's there's no reason why you can't do both. So, for example, if you decide to do chemo, maybe you can do low dose chemo, and maybe you can fast around the chemo. And because there, there's studies showing that if you fast around the same time you get chemo, the chemo works better and you get fewer side effects, and you need less chemo. So I, I wouldn't wouldn't view it as as an either or, but but yes, I, I definitely saw some patients at Hippocrates with cancer where the cancer got better. Um, but I also saw patients there who had who had received chemo and they went there to try to detoxify from the effects yeah. of the chemo. The, the same thing with True North. And and what I'll say is that there are are I, I would seek out integrative approach because there are definitely some um there are many different options and your traditional oncologists won't necessarily tell you about it and, and and what i find scary is some of the data that um you know chemotherapy in general just prolongs life by 58 days or something like that and again that's in general now if you with one specific type of cancer uh, but you know cancer is a pretty diverse is a pretty diverse um uh, constellation, you know, breast cancer is different than skin cancer, which is different than multiple myeloma. So, but to answer your question, I do have, you know, direct observation where I've seen cancer uh, get better 
with with dietary changes, including fasting, it works better for the slower growing cancers because you have more time to make that shift. And that would be things like prostate cancer. Is that the case? That, that that's true. Prostate is all is is often slowly growing. So so yes, I've seen I've seen it help for prostate cancer too. But but it's not like I can show you an FDA approved you know, yeah. study on it. But again, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with with getting treatment from an oncologist, but also seeking out uh, certain herbal uh, remedies. Or you know, there's a test out of Greece where you can actually take you, you can measure for circulating uh, cancer cells in your bloodstream, and then figure out which type of either natural product and or chemotherapy agents will directly go after those circulating cancer stem cells that, that lead to recurrence. Yeah. In terms of late stage cancers, like people at stage four, stage three, stage four, with, you know, maybe full blown tumors and things like that and whatever else that are beyond medical help at that point. And you know, they, essentially they've been told, it's, you know, you, you, you have to maybe just go home and sort out your affairs and all that kind of thing. Have you ever seen cases like that get better or reverse or in, in True North or Hippocrates or anyone that's been that far along that's had a, that's made a recovery? The answer is yes. I have seen patients with advanced stage four cancer, you know, go into remission and, and get better. and you know, and when you present those cases to oncologists, they say, oh, yeah, well, you know, cancer can go into remission. You know, that's not proof. Uh, but but, but I've also seen patients who were too far gone, who were basically on hospice. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say wait until the very last day to say, oh, are there alternatives? Um, but I, I would never give up hope. And, right. And, right. And, and, and what I've seen, I wish I could, I, I wish I could have other physicians, you know, see what I've seen, which is, that, be, be, that that things are not set in stone necessarily, and um, and that's why I think it's imperative to look at other things, including diet, mm -hmm. uh, and but, but but also say share with people. Uh, I, I've seen people who who were able to cure their cancer, you know, by changing their diet, but then here, here's the part that was really sad. But then a year or two later, they're like, oh, my cancer is all better. I can go back to eating the traditional Western diet. And then the cancer came back and then they passed on. Amazing. So, it's amazing. so, so, so what I learned is, you know, you, you don't, we're, we're not like cats. You, you don't get nine lives. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's serious. And, uh, but, but I, it's also humbling because, I mean, I was, I, I've been addicted to the salt, oil, and sugar, and that was really hard to cut out for me. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's interesting to me. I, 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 I'm, I'm interested to hear that. And I, my impression is it seems quite rare to see people. Uh, and and I, I'm very cautious to give anyone advice to, especially to just do this. I would never say just do, just go raw and you'll be, yeah, you'll reverse your cancer. Like I, I, <laughs> I don't believe that really, but, but maybe uh, it's, 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 it's nice to know that maybe in cases it, it May well, help, but, uh, yeah, but, but but I would say is not just in the cancer area. I mean, I think for your viewers who are raw vegan, that I, I think that's amazing. That's so helpful for your health. But that's not enough. You need to exercise enough and get enough sleep, reduce your stress, have connection, and I think also smart supplementation. I don't think. Um, that on our diets we're getting an optimal amount of nitric oxide and nmn two supplements two molecules that have recently been shown to promote longevity and turn back the biologic clock so un, un, unlike some places i am not opposed to supplements um to, okay. to promote life. yeah sure we'll, we'll 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 get around to that topic that'll be interesting okay um I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to ask you about Hippocrates. I, I think that this is probably enough information, but, but those those are some of the main things, the, the, the fruit element. That was definitely a big question I wanted to ask about it. Um, but but, 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 but I, th I think the other thing, just from a philosophical standpoint, at both Hippocrates and at True North Fasting Center, 
a lot of the benefit may not be really what people are eating as much as what they're not eating, right. not eating all the processed food. I mean, frankly, I think it's both, but it's 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 both the yin and yang. It's both what you're eating and also what you're not. You're not putting these poisons into your into your body. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I, I like I like that message. Um, let's talk a little bit about fasting then in general. It, it can be a bit of a controversial topic, and definitely it's not something in the mainstream that is uh, really thought about very much, and definitely not recommended in a lot of medical situations, apart from maybe if someone's got an operation or something, they, they don't eat for a day or these kind of things, preparing for that. But um, it's it's everyone kind of knows what it is, but very few people uh, maybe religious people sometimes are doing a little bit of fasting and things. It's, it's not a very common thing. And the idea of doing a 30-day fast, people would think that was crazy, or a 21-day fast. The average person would think that was a pretty crazy thing to do. There's also the whole eating disorder thing that it's all very, feels like a lot of people would think that's an eating disorder and and, and stuff like that. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what, what was your kind of journey with fasting and what you think about it overall and uh, I'm guessing maybe going back to say your medical training and everything at first I'm assuming that at first that fasting maybe wasn't something that you knew much about or or were particularly interested in at first. Yeah so my my I would say that's true up until maybe a dozen years ago I wasn't really interested in fasting because I personally found it so difficult you know it, it, it was you know, I think I was like most Americans that think like if, if you don't eat for three hours, you might die <laughs> because, you know, if you're addicted to sugar, like you, you, you need your hit. Um, you know, so, so I, was, I was definitely aware, like we talked about, that if you restrict calories, that you're, you prolong your life. But, you know, again, how do you restrict calories? Well, one way is to fast. But that that didn't sound like fun to me. So I would I would agree with you that this is, has been a recent eye opening experience to see to experience personally, and then to to help others with uh, water fasting and, and juice fasting, and watching them watching their health improve dramatically. Why does fasting help people, and what what does it actually do? Yeah, so so a couple of things. So number one, if you look back historically, you know, our ancestors fasted, many of them did because they didn't have a choice, because there, there were times of famine when, when food wasn't available. So it makes sense that fasting, that, that our bodies are 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 designed to occasionally fast because that's how our ancestors were. They didn't have a choice about it. Number one. Number two, from a from a biochemical standpoint. What I find fascinating is during a water fast, what will happen is initially your body will start breaking down. Um, they'll break down the, um, the bad proteins, the, the form proteins in your body is called autophagy. And you know when, when the body is um, basically relying on, on, on fat stores and, and breaking down some of these bad proteins, that can be a good thing. To me, one of the most exciting things is not during that is not what happens during the fast, but when you break the fast, your body all of a sudden is releasing all these stem cells to rebuild your body. Ah. So, so, you know, and, and I've seen clinically that you know so you, you can give someone you know their own or other stem cells, and you can have regeneration. But this is cool. When when you start refeeding after a fast, you you all of a sudden your body makes your own stem cells, and so I think that's one of the huge benefits of water fasting. And and let me just be clear here: I'm I'm not recommending people go off and do a 30 day water fast all by themselves. I mean, at True North, we were rounding on people twice a day, and yes, there there are ways to do you know tele consulting for fasting, but but um, I mean, I mean, this is a real medical procedure, in my opinion, and you should be doing it with some experts. And the uh, stem cells, would they do they not get created so much when we're usually eating, when we're having a typical kind of lifestyle? 
True. I mean, th there is a small production of stem cells, but 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 when you fast and when you start the refeed, that's when you get a whole burst of stem cells. And I believe it's more than what you would have received otherwise during that period. So I guess this this uh, fasting is something to me that gets a lot of attention in the in the raw food movement and the alternative health movement and and almost more than the diet sometimes it feels like people kind of like yeah the diet i get it even if they're not really doing it they're not really following the diet but the, but they're more amazed by this fasting thing because i think people feel there's a miraculous thing that's going to happen for them um there are a number of different claims around fasting and i'd like to understand how true or how real some of these things are. For example, people talk about toxins will release from the body. Sometimes you hear people talk about liquids coming out of their eyes or stuff coming out of their pores or all sorts of different weird stuff coming out of people's bodies. And the idea around that is that we've taken in maybe all these toxins and chemicals over the years and these are kind of stuck in the body somewhere. And so when we fast, all this stuff is, has a chance to come out. And I've never understood exactly how that happens. And I've never really found the research on that and how that works. Can you explain some of that? And is that real? And maybe some stories or things that you've seen? Sure, uh, Ronnie, that's a great question. And I think the first thing to be clear is we do not have a lot of research in humans on what happens when we fast, specifically on toxins. I, I, I want to do that research. I don't think that research exists. So what, I, what I'm telling you is based more on other animals in my own experience. But with my own experience, when I water fasted for 10 days, my visceral fat uh, went down dramatically. And, and it makes sense because when you're fasting, your body is going to go for fuel from your fat. And, and because it's going to go for fat, it's going to go for the most metabolically active the fat which is a visceral fat and the visceral fat is the fat that covers your organs like your liver and your kidneys and and your heart and things like that so and if you think about if you if you imagine you've got fat cells that are being burned for the purpose of providing fuel while you're fasting when you take fat cells well within the fat cells i should be clear there are these fat soluble toxins that we talked a little bit about the pcbs the ddt um, some of these man-made chemicals, the forever chemicals, are, are actually in your fat cells. So it makes sense if you're taking these fat cells and you're burning the fat and getting, getting, making them smaller, that in the process of doing that, you're going to mobilize the fatty toxins, the fatty mold toxins and other toxins within there. And that's why you mentioned, like you might see, you know, pores in your face and, and other things that it's it's just you know visualize you know fat and if you're if you're making that fat go from two pounds to one pound if you're losing a pound of fat during that period it just makes sense that that the toxins within that pound they got to go someplace and that someplace is going to be probably everywhere they can go whether it's the blood the lymphatics you know in the stool everywhere now of course when you're fasting you're not stooling um, normally so. Um, I think uh, I think that's one of the powerful effects of fasting is detoxification. But just at, the scientist in me says I would I wish there were people studying this, but for whatever reason, um, yeah. I think the, the, the most studies I found were you know maybe in in ten ten humans like we have case reports. We don't have good studies of a hundred humans fasting and where do their toxin levels go before, during, and after their fast. Um, so it'd be, it'd be great to get, I mean, there's there's a lot of money floating around the world and there's a lot of money going into research. And perhaps that all goes into chemical research, pharmaceutical. So maybe we need uh, a donor out there to come in and um, give someone like yourself or a bunch of people some money to do this kind of research around fasting or in plant-based diet. This is something I think that, would be very useful to do and and um would i i just i'm just thinking of the the, the billionaires the trillionaires out there that have all this money that are looking to do something useful with it and this could this is the kind of research that could really change 
that dramatically change healthcare and dramatically change uh, health results? A hundred percent. And just to, to give you a specific question I get asked all the time that I cannot answer about this is during your water fast, I mean, at True North, we wouldn't give anything else uh, besides water during the fast. But if your goal is to remove toxins, should you be giving, is there anything, binders or anything else that you should be doing during a water fast to decrease your toxin levels? And, you know, should you be giving intravenous uh, glutathione and phosphatidylcholine and, and other things? Again, we that's not what's done at True North. And sure. I don't think that's been studied in humans. Sure. If, if you if you if your goal is to remove toxins, you know, is it just water fasting, or are there things that you can add to it? And logically, it makes sense you could add to it, but we don't know the answer to that. Something that is an interesting topic, and this may be a quick one, is another thing that's been in the natural health world and the raw vegan world a long time. This is the concept of mucoid plaque, and I don't know if you've heard of this idea. It's the idea that over the years the food is kind of stuck onto the internal lining of the intestines and it's all stuck there, it's formed a plaque and that when people fast or detox that all of this hardened stuff that looks like the shape of an intestine all, all of a sudden comes out and it could be 20 pounds of stuff coming out of a person. And um, the, the way that it's shared with people is that, there's, that is that exactly that it's all stuck inside people. And a lot of people are really aggravated by that idea and, and find it very uh, compelling to them. What's your thoughts on that concept? Yeah, I think there is some truth in that for in, in this in this degree, specifically the concept of biofilm. And we talked about it a little bit before. Biofilm is this biologic film that bacteria form in, in our bodies. We all have biofilm in our mouth, which is why we hopefully brush our teeth to clean our mouth. But another area that bugs like to form this film, and this film is to protect itself from our body's immune system. One place that the body loves to form this biofilm is in our gut. And it's true when you're water fasting, there is no fuel for all these bugs in your gut. So by, by, by definition, these bugs can no longer grow, the, the good and the bad. Basically, I think your microbiome is is reorganized during the water fast. So from that standpoint, if you imagine this biofilm, this biologic film as kind of a, a mucoid plaque, uh, from, from, to that extent, I, I think that's true, that because th these bugs in your gut are not getting any fuel for the week or three weeks or however long your water fast, that you, you're basically destroying them. And that's why the refeeding portion is, is key because you want to reestablish a normal microbiome during that time period. So you, uh, I just wanted to make sure that I picked up your phrase there. You said that the biofilm forms to protect ourselves from the body's immune system. No, 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 no. The biofilm is produced by the bugs to protect the bugs from our own immune system. Ah, okay, sorry. Or, or, or other bugs for that matter. So, um, so, and that's why biofilm loves to form in different parts of the body, including, you know, if you have any implants in your body, it'll form on the surface. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's dangerous to have implants that you don't need in your body because biofilm can form oh, oh, like, uh, like, like a hip, a prosthetic hip. It'll form on the metal of the hip itself because your body's normal immune system can't, can't get there. That's, that's, that's fascinating. And, and, and to be clear, I think biofilm can go anywhere in the body. We see it in the brain. We see it, we see it everywhere. And um, it's, it's a battle. It, would yeah. that be a thick substance? It, it, biofilm can be thick. I mean, but you know, you think about, it. imagine you don't brush your teeth for a day. I mean, it doesn't feel good. I, I guess if you look in your mouth, you don't really see Right, right, right. But you can imagine if you, and I've certainly seen patients with bad oral hygiene, it does look like a plaque eventually. Right, a plaque, yeah. But, yeah. but, but, but I'm, not, I'm not suggesting anyone in the audience get to that stage. I see, I see. Well, that's an interesting thought. Um, the microbiome you brought up, and there's a number of people who are doing different things where they're measuring their microbiome 
they are attempting to increase their microbiome score in a certain way and eat more variety. And the idea is that the more variety you eat, the better this is for your microbiome and maybe the better this is for your health overall. Do you have any thoughts on that or ideas about the microbiome you want to share? Yeah, so first of all, I, I just got back from Harvard. I'm at 30th Med School Reunion, and there, there was a researcher there who all, all she does is research the microbiome, and she basically said, this is a brand new field. We, we only have 10 years of research. So the reality is when, when you have hear me or anyone else give advice about the microbiome, it's, it's just that. It's, it's initial impressions because it's confusing because there's certain bacteria that are helpful in one situation but then can hurt you in another it's it, it's not like the, the good bacteria are green and the bad ones are red you know it's we're trying to figure this out so but, but from a standpoint of, of maximizing a good microbiome it, it makes sense to me to eat a variety of different foods but to me the most important thing and this may be obvious to to the viewers is that you want to have a lot of fiber in your diet because the fiber is the fuel for the healthy microbiome. Right, right. Do you ascribe at all to the idea of trying to eat a, a great deal of variety to stimulate the microbiome or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I do like variety as opposed to a mono diet. Sure. Um, sure. Have you heard ever of the concept of dry fasting? And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm aware of dry fasting, and, and, and certainly in certain religions, I, I, th I think dry fasting is a lot harder than water fasting, and I think in some ways is more dangerous. I mean, I'm not opposed to people doing it, but I, I wouldn't um, dry fast for long periods of time, and um, I, I honestly, I don't see the benefit of dry fasting compared to water fasting. The only the, the other thing I'm interested in with fasting, it, it within obviously the, the people that promote it and share about it often would claim that there's no downside to it and that it is a completely positive process and there's almost no risk to it and and so on and so forth my impression more and more is there might be and i don't know exactly this but i i i have the impression more that there might be negatives or, or downsides or potential risks to it especially long-term fasting and I've heard things like, for example, that, and maybe this is a different situation, but say in, in times of war, in times of uh, concentration camps and things like that, where people were limited in terms of their food for a period of time, that it has an impact on them potentially for life, or it has an impact even genetically on their offspring. And I've, I've heard these ideas, and I'm, I'm interested to know, do you think there is any negative side to fasting, any risk to it? anything long term that, that can be affected and any comments on anything I've, I've said there? Yeah, so, so in general, I think there is a risk to fasting by yourself without any supervision or help. Uh, I mean, I've seen people do it and have successful results, but just to be upfront, I've definitely seen patients water fasting in a supervised setting who ran into trouble and we were able to rescue them, you know, maybe switch them from water fasting to juice fasting and then bring them back to water fasting before. So again, I recommend you do this under medical supervision. You you brought up the fact, you know, under the Holocaust, you know, you had Holocaust survivors who were, um, you know, who were forced to, to fast in some ways. The, the interesting thing is from the data that I've seen, I think that their survival was longer meaning that it was if if you went through the holocaust which is obviously just such a despicable time period but and you were a survivor that your life expectancy was actually much better afterwards now you could argue well that's because you know the going through a concentration camp selected for you know people with better genes or better survival i think that might be part of it but i think there's also the part of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger so I think people who fast on a regular basis and, you know, um, have, will have a longer life expectancy. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of fasting, but I'm also not rigid that, you know, you have to do a five day water fast or a 10 or a 20 day. No, start fasting wherever you are. And if it's, I, I think intermittent fasting is a good place to start, you know, just, you know, maybe skip breakfast, you know, 
um, for for a week or two and, and see how you feel. Do you have any thoughts on water or the type of water that should be drank or like is it important to filter water and these these kind of questions? Yeah, so yeah, yes, I think it's very important to have filtered water. You don't want all the toxins. You don't want the pharmaceuticals that are in the water. You don't want all these bad things. So at the North, we would use double distilled water. And, and I recommend for everyone that they drink water that, you know, doesn't have the bad things in it. Double distilled? Yeah. Yeah, be, because that way you're sure that you're not introducing anything, you know, bad into the human system. And people will say, well, yeah, but what, what's going to happen to your minerals? And, and the truth is that our body already has those minerals. You know, we normally get those minerals from food, but we're adapted to be able to survive just on water for, you know, many weeks. You know, if, if we have adequate fat supplies, fat stores. Um, yeah, so now, do we ever have patients who were water fasting and their sodium level ended up going down and we had to end the fast? Yes, that, that did happen, but it wasn't that common. You mentioned sodium there, and I was actually thinking about asking you about salt, and you mentioned the addiction to salt, sugar, and oil, and so on. What's, what do you think about salt, and is, is it a requirement of our diet? Do we need it? Do we, um, are we eating too much of it? What, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so if you're eating plants, if you're eating food, there's already salt in that we don't need extra salt in general. Mm -hmm. So I understand people who are addicted to salt want extra salt. They want the food tastes better if you add salt. But I would strongly recommend people getting away from adding salt to their diet, which includes avoiding processed foods. Because if you look at the sodium in the processed foods, it's sky high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, now, I guess let's get into to we'll get into longevity, but also you're doing a summit on dementia, and I'd like to ask you about that. You're you're talking about reversing dementia, which is a really terrible condition. I think it's something that a lot of people that are very casual about their diet or cavalier about their diet or don't think they need to change everything or they feel like they're a fit and healthy person and and they're doing a the standard diet or whatever, I think that they are potentially blindly walking into an absolute nightmare of the last 20 years of their life uh, with things like dementia, Alzheimer's, um, being a major risk for people on a standard diet, I think, and um, and a nightmare for their family around them, uh, probably more so for, than them. But uh, Let's talk about dementia a little bit and what causes it, why does it happen, and how can you be so confident that it can be reversed? Yeah, I. There, there are many different causes for dementia, but some of the major causes are poor vasculature or poor blood supply. And I am confident that there are certain things you can do to prevent or reverse dementia based on research studies that show there are specific things, specific risk factors, like your homocysteine level being too high, that um, if you reverse that, you can improve your vascular system and reduce your risk of dementia. So, you know, I'm not making a blanket statement that all, all forms of dementia can be reversed, but I agree with you. If, if people don't make any changes, that they could well be in for a, a bad future. I mean, I saw it with my own grandmother, uh, you know, with her dementia, she, you know, she, she lived several years of her, of her life at the end, <clears throat> not knowing, not understanding, not knowing who she was. And, and I don't think anyone wants that for our family or for ourselves. I think that what some people talk about is vascular dementia, that there's actually a form of dementia that they openly say is cholesterol related. <clears throat> Exactly right. It, 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 it happens when the the blood supply, the endothelium, the lining of your blood vessels get filled up with calcium and and other toxins. True, and 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 that's and that's what not causes not just you know brain problems. It causes 
heart disease and other organ problems. So you're as healthy as your blood vessels. If, if you're eating a high fat diet, a lot of those fat in Western diet, a lot of those fats will end up getting deposited in your blood vessels, which then become calcified and stop working at some point. Yeah, I'd like to understand that process a little bit more. So I've, I've, always, I've known that for a long time, the idea that one of the benefits of going to a plant-based diet is that we can reverse that hardening of the arteries and the yeah. blockages in the arteries. But what is it that causes that exactly? You know, people say high cholesterol and different things, but can you explain that a little bit more of why that, why does that process happen? Yeah, so basically there's this, there's this molecule called cholesterol that we all need, but we, and we, and our, our cells make cholesterol on its own. But if you're eating external cholesterol from animal products, there, there are no, there's no cholesterol in plants. But if you're eating a lot of animal products, you're getting extra forms of cholesterol. And if you're cooking those, those cholesterol, if you're cooking that meat, um, a lot of the cholesterol will end up getting oxidized. This is recent research. We didn't used to be able to measure oxidized cholesterol. But it turns out that cooking will oxidize cholesterol in meat. And then also mentioning these fatty toxins that have a half-life of 10 or 20 years, like the PCBs and the DDTs, those will also be able to oxidize cholesterol in your body. And it's the oxidized cholesterol that can do damage to the blood vessel wall, which then will, will cause the formation of these plaques, which, you know, in, in, you know, eating one fatty meal is not going to do it. But if you're doing it every day or three times a day for decades and decades and decades, eventually these small fatty streaks in your blood vessels turn into blockages. But, yeah. but, 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 there, but there are things you can do to prevent it besides obviously cut out the fat, but, but as we get older, our nitric oxide levels in our blood vessels go down. Nitric oxide is a gas that help, helps open up blood vessels. And nitric oxide is, ma is made in, in the mouth and the gut from leafy greens. So if you're eating more leafy greens oh, and, wow. and, and, and beets, um, that, that will help, the nitric oxide will help reverse and open up blood vessels. And, you know, talking about longevity, I think there are two key molecules you want to maximize. One is nitric oxide, one is NMN. And the reason that nitric oxide and NMN, you want to maximize both of those, is that those both optimize the three nerdy biochemical pathways I mentioned, you know, a while back in this interview, the sirtuins and the AMPK and the mTOR system. So this, this all ties together. So I mean, for the viewers and for the listeners and for people that might be new to all this, one of the major reasons of going plant-based and cutting out the animal foods is what you're saying here is the, the cholesterol is, can oxidize and causes these fatty streaks and leads to these blockages, which are the cause of heart disease, strokes, potentially types of dementia and other damage to the body. Um, so that, that that would be one of the major problems with that diet. True. And, and, and it's not just me. It's, um, we're seeing this now in India where they love ghee, which is clarified butter. What is clarified butter? You take butter, which is high in cholesterol, and you heat it up. And when you heat up butter, you heat up the cholesterol, you produce more of the, <clears throat> more of the oxidized cholesterol, which, which does this damage within your body. Great. Well, it, obviously, you're going to do the, the summit on dementia, so there's a lot of people that are, are going to be interested in that and, and, and uh, certainly share information about that to everyone. So let's get on to longevity. I think that's one of the things you're really interested in talking about. And I, I think that my idea with longevity is that there's... Um, there's a blue zone study and there's different things and there's different parts of the world and, and they seem to have seen that plant-based diet is, is good for longevity and uh, obviously an active lifestyle and uh, different factors are good for longevity and obviously uh, plant-based because of re reducing the risk of some of these diseases that cut people's lives down short. Um, what's your interest in, in longevity and What's your thoughts on it and your whole, whole approach to it? 
Yeah, so I am now super optimistic about longevity because of the research showing that you, you can turn back your biologic clock with things like exercise, eating the right things, and smart supplementation. And specifically, you know, if you, you can take NMN that gets converted to NAD, which will turn back the biologic age, um, and, and also nitric oxide. So I, I'm super excited because, you know, just a few years ago, I would have thought this is science fiction, but, you know, you know, we, we, there was a Nobel Prize in 2012 for, you know, identifying three genes that can lead to regeneration. And the, the fact that there are simple things we can all do, you know, whether that's get enough exercise, get enough sleep, take the right supplements, eat the right plants, I think that's super exciting and, and my energy level now is much higher. So, you know, I, I talk to people like, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, I'm going to retire. Like, I don't think I'm going to retire. I think I'm going to end up having a bunch of different careers. Just, I, I think I've got more energy now than I think I've ever had. And, and it's because I'm doing the right things. Brilliant. So the, the, supplementation that you're talking about is not it doesn't appear to be actually nutritional supplementation in terms of some people would suggest for example a lot of people would suggest because of the food supply and things we don't get enough minerals we don't get enough vitamins but you're not really saying that it seems you're talking about this thing nmn and nitric oxide which is slightly different to that yeah i'm saying both if, if you are deficient in minerals you should supplement that i find that most people whether they're vegan, raw, or you know whatever their diet is, are deficient in vitamin D and vitamin B12, regardless of what you're eating. And in modern society, and if you are, you can check your levels and you can supplement. And, and I recommend people do that. But on top of that, there are other supplements. There are nitric oxide supplements. My, my favorite is Cardi Miracle, but there, there are many different nitric oxide supplements. Yes, I want you to eat green leafy vegetables, but the problem is the half-life after you eat the green leafy vegetables for your nitric oxide production is only for like four hours. Whereas some of these newer supplements uh, for nitric oxide, you get 24 to 36 hours of, of nitric oxide. So same thing with NMN. If you're taking NMN on a daily basis, the, the, the uh, NAD level in your cell, and this is getting very nerdy, um, will, will, will go up and stay up even if you miss a dose or a day of the NMN. But I mean, there, there are other supplements that I recommend too, even for raw vegans because of their anti-aging properties. One of those is creatine, which, you know, which it sounds crazy. Creatine is a, is a, is a uh, waste product, but it turns out from the studies in humans and other animals that you can prolong life and help build muscle by giving people creatine, you know, up to four or five grams a day in people. And and, and some of the listeners there may, may be like, well, where's the double blind, you know, placebo controlled study showing that I should be taking creatine, NMN, and nitric oxide? And my argument to you is, you know, I think those studies are, are ongoing as we're waiting. But if you really want to look at longevity to, and do a good study, it's going to be, what, you know, yeah. 40, 50, <laughs> 60 years. You know, when we're talking about longevity. <clears throat> You don't want to be in the control group. I don't want to be in the control group, which is why I'm being more aggressive and looking and searching for the best supplements yeah. and, but, and lifestyle changes to make. I, 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 the thing I feel about supplements, and I, I wouldn't say there's no need for them or whatever, but from what I've seen is that you can get an audience of people, for example, who are listening to this information or watching a lecture or trying to read books and, and everything and trying to research this and they're being encouraged to change their diet and exercise and do these things but when you say supplement it's like everyone sees that as well that's the easy thing i can do and so they go towards the supplementation and they kind of end up neglecting some of the other things so uh, i think there are people who are who change their diet and have a fantastic diet and totally don't want to do supplementation and I understand that side of it. But I think there's I think there's maybe more people that if you say supplement, they, they think that's the medical fix on its own. And um it, I, I think that that's the to me that's a bit of the caution about it is that 
there's some people that, that changing the diet is too complicated or difficult or they just see it as and, and they're looking for that quick fix um what do you think about that yeah i, I think that's a valid criticism and, and it works both ways to say no there is no one magic pill or prescription drug or supplement that's going to fix all your problems just like there's no one you know sure you you can completely clean up your diet but if you're not going to exercise if you're not if you're going to have a high stress condition you you're not going to end up with an ideal outcome but but i also want to um i think we should would we should practice self love in, in in to the extent that you don't have to do all make all these changes today right you know pick pick maybe one today and one next week or one next month and and, and get there but but i think you know, from my own my own journey, I mean, it took me years to make these changes with my yeah, diet. Yeah. So, so I, I totally relate to what you're saying, but also some people just aren't ready, which is okay. Some people need to hear this. I know I I need to hear this information many many different times before I make changes. I like to ask you a question about. I'm sure we can talk a few things about longevity, but. I'm interested in the element of longevity that is the community aspect of it, or the social aspect, or the religious belief aspect. So it seems that I seem to have picked up on information that suggests that, that the communities that had the longest living lifestyles had this element of being living in community uh, or being quite close to community, family orientated and often having some kind of religious aspect to life or, or whatever and i'm really interested in that community thing because i think now as much as people might be deficient with a bad diet which i think is a is a terrible thing um there's also a lot of impacts i think with people living on their own a lot and a lot of people now live in their own space in their own place don't have a family and um maybe don't see their friends and family as much and they're watching screens all the time I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. And should we actually almost like a like a medical prescription prescribed to people? You need to get out. You need to be with people. You need to find community. You need to find connection. Yeah, no, I think connection is key. And, you know, that, I think that's one of the effective things at both Hippocrates and True North is you're there. You're not just by yourself. You're in a community trying to improve your lifestyle. And I think that's true. Even if you're not at one of those communities, you want to form your own community. Now, ideally, you could physically live with other people who are interested in doing what we're just talking about. And I would love to, to help create communities like that. But realistically, until that happens, because unfortunately right now, there are, those communities are very few and far between, is you know, we online we can we can create a community like this to to give people the support they need to make those changes. It's another one. It's another one for the uh, billionaire donor out there who wants to <laughs> money towards a, a, a longevity community or a retirement community for for people that want to extend life and live together and eat a healthy diet. That that would be. A, I think that's a brilliant idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah Ron, Ronnie is, is amazing. Like they're bill literally billions of dollars going into um, pharmaceutical longevity right. research, which I think is great because I want to be one of the beneficiaries of, of one of those sure. pills someday. But but yeah, the, the the fact that why don't we just put some of those money into creating a really healthy community for for us or baby boomers or whatever population it is. Well, I've really enjoyed the conversation today, Doctor Hellman. I've taken up a lot of your time. And uh, I, well, l let me give you some time to share with everyone, you know, anything that you want to share. What are you doing at the moment? How can people reach out to you? Are you ser are you offering help to people at the moment? Are you serving people? Are you um, may maybe looking for a position even? What, what, what is it that you're doing right now and how can people find out more about it? Yeah, so so what I'm doing right now is is what we're doing right now. I want to spread the word that there are simple things that everyone can do to turn back the biologic clock and promote longevity. And the best ways to reach me are through my website, which is just drjosh.com, drjosh.com, or if you want to email me, it's 
Dr. Josh at drjosh.com. Um, on my website, I do have um, a list of a, a bunch of my own favorite longevity supplements. But of course, that's not the only changes that you want to make. And watch out for in November, uh, I am doing this online summit on reversing dementia. The company I'm partnering with is called Health Means. And uh, stay tuned for that. And if, if you have a group that or a podcast or a similar thing that you would like me to speak with, I'm definitely open to those opportunities too. And I am doing one-on-one -on -one consults. I enjoy those, but I enjoy even more spreading this information because you're, you're not going to hear this from most of your physicians. Most physicians don't know this information and we need to spread this as soon as possible. So Ronnie, thank you so much for inviting me today. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. We'd, we'd love to do it again. I'm sure there's so many more things that we could we could go over. It's such a huge topic, and it sounds like you've got a, a lot to share. So I do encourage people to check out what you're doing, and definitely the summit as well, which is going to be fantastic. And thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I will just say to everyone, if you're looking for an experience, some community, then uh, UK Fruit Fest is a raw vegan festival. It happens every year, end of July. We still have some limited, well, we kind of sold out, but we may open up some extra tickets. We're looking at space currently, so you, you can get in touch with us if it's of interest. And um, you can join us on Love Fruit Podcast. We have uh, over 120 of these interviews. Feel free to look through those and share them with other people. We'd, we'd love to, you to help us do that. And we also, on Friday nights, we have a call, a Zoom call for free, Fruity Fridays. We usually have a presenter on to uh, share something and uh, maybe Dr. Josh can come on at some point and share something That'd be fun. And yeah. live <laughs> and, and take questions as well in a live setting. That'd be brilliant. So thank you very much everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you again in another episode of the Love Fruit podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you.